Well, hey there, everybody. Welcome back to our series on basic econometrics. Uh, in this uh, presentation, we're going to be introducing time series data and some of the issues that we encounter associated with it. Now, this we'll have several series or several lectures on time series data specifically. Uh, this is the beginning, right? So there are there are many issues associated with time series data uh, that that will not be covered in this lecture. What will we cover in this lecture? Okay. Specifically, we'll introduce time series uh, data compared to what we work with so far, which is cross-sectional data. We'll talk about the problem uh, that is frequently encountered with time series data, that is serial correlation. Uh, and we'll talk about the consequences of that, the detection of it, and some remedies of it. There are other issues associated with time series data, such as stationarity, that we will not be getting at in this presentation. Okay. okay, so up to this point we've been looking at cross-sectional data. That is where we have ob observations of several variables occurring at a fixed point in time. So all of our observations were at point in time x. Uh, or, or if there was some variation in time, we'd made corrections to essentially place all of our observations at some point in time. With this lecture, we're going to shift to talking a little bit about time series data. That is where we have a set of observations of a specific variable that occurs over different time periods. So for example, like GDP, we have GDP, gross domestic product, excuse me. We have gross domestic product in say 2010, 2011, 2012, 2013, so on and so forth. And we're explaining, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're explaining how those relate to each other. Okay. There is also the uh, possibility of what's so-called panel data or longitudinal, longitudinal data, uh, which combines both of these, which we will get to in future lectures. Okay, so before we dig into time series data, uh, uh, we need to make a quick note about notation, pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> so let's say we have something like this over here, right? So which is what we've seen so far, where we're trying to explain uh, why, uh, in terms of a number of variables associated with that. So for example, we might be trying to explain the price of a car. So the price of the the i car based upon uh, various explanatory variables. Uh, such as maybe like the size of the car or the gas mileage that the car gets or the features the car gets. Uh, but all those variables are associated with the car, which we are trying to explain the price of. This is notated as the series of i's over here being the car, okay? Okay, so with time series data, as we see over here, uh, the notation has changed to t's. So we're talking about at a particular point in time. So now it becomes the dependent variable at a specific point in time, t, which could be distinguished from, say, a future point in time, t plus 1, or a past point in time, say, t minus 1. Okay. The dependent variable at a particular point in time, t, can be explained by a series of explanatory variables, in this case x1, x2, and so on, at a particular point in time. In this case, all in time t. Okay. However, we could certainly have explanatory variables from other time periods uh, in, in this analysis, and indeed almost certainly would do. Now, there are a number of issues that one encounters in doing time series analysis that are not really present or, or, or are more significant in time series analysis when compared to cross-sectional analysis. First off, the order of observations in time series is fixed, right? We have t, t plus 1, t plus 2, t plus 3, and so on, right? So the observations are all slotted into a particular point along a uh, unidirectional moving time, right? Okay, so that's a constraint that we haven't had to deal with so far. Second, time series samples tend to be smaller, you know, when compared to cross-sectional ones. So if we think like GDP, you know, if we're talking annual GDP, what do we get? We get one observation per year, right? Whereas if we're talking about like cross-sectional data, say, you know, something we were trying to build a demand curve from, you know, we would, we would hope we would have thousands and thousands of observations. Third, the economic theory associated with time series data is much more complicated when compared to cross-sectional data. Okay, so the economic theory associated with cross-sectional data, I don't mean to imply that it's simple because it's, it's not. Um, but when compared to time series data, we're talking about causality uh, and, well, correlation and, and potentially causality over periods of time.
of course, uh, you know, this is a problem we're going to spend most of our time with here today is that the error term in time series, uh, estimated time series equations uh, in any given a period are often, more often than not, are going to be affected by events in previous periods, right? So that is to say, like, uh, there are degrees of, of serial correlation. Um, you know, pure serial correlation, as we see here, occurs when the error term occurs in the error term. Excuse me, when there's correlation between observations of the error term and the correctly specified error term. Okay, and specifically, first order serial correlation uh, occurs when the current value of the error term is a function of the previous error term. Uh, within those within those ideas of uh, pure and impure serial correlation, we can have the possibility of so-called positive serial correlation, which we see uh, over over here, right? Uh, and then also uh, negative serial correlation. Yeah. Okay, now some things about serial correlation. What is serial correlation doing to your estimated regression equation? Okay, it is not causing bias in your coefficients. So because you have serial correlation, does not you know does not get you to a situation where you have biased coefficients. Um, what it does do is it causes the OLS uh, process uh, to no longer be a minimum variance estimator. Uh, and as a consequence, if we run OLS in a situation where or we're utilizing uncorrected OLS in a situation where we have serial correlation, what's happening is that the standard errors associated with our, our betas or our estimated coefficients is that they're uh, biased. Uh, so the standard errors can no longer be relied upon. Damaging the ability of our estimators to predict. Uh, it's not, not specifically biasing them, but it's uh, reducing their predictive capacity. Uh, so how do, how do we detect, right? Well, there's a few different ways to detect serial correlation. Um, I'm not going to go through them all here, right? I'm going to go sort of through the bread and butter uh, methods, right? <clears throat> and the first one of those is the classic, right? It's this one here, the Durbin-Watson test. Okay, so it tests for serial for, excuse me, it tests for first order serial correlation uh, through an examination of the residuals. And before I go any further here, when you're doing time series analysis, uh, you, you know, one of the first things you should be doing to kind of detect problems is, is to start by plotting the residuals. Um, and uh, in, in, a, in a previous lecture, I showed you how to do that in eViews 11. Any good statistical software or even you know free stuff, it, it, heck, EV, you can do it in eViews, um, is going to allow you to per plot the residuals. So just sort of taking a look at it, right, and you, you kind of saw in the previous slides what, what some of the problem patterns would look like. Uh, if you can notice this, you know, these sort of clear relationships in in your observations of the residuals, then you can be pretty sure you have you have some problems there. Uh, that said, uh, one should not sort of end with plotting the residuals. That's sort of step one, right? Uh, maybe a second step is to review the uh, durbin waston statistic, which is generally presented at the bottom of your regression uh, output. Um, the durbin waston test looks like looks like this, right? So, or it starts from this idea, I should say. So we have an error term t that we believe is somehow correlated with the error term in previous periods, right? That's the whole sort of thing, uh, e t minus one in this case. It's it's not e, right? But it looks like an e. Okay, and then we also assume we have some 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 other random stuff out there there that that can be characterized in this you know classically distributed error term, and we can also uh, express the functional relationship between the current error term and the previous error term, right? So that that's our uh, that's our autocorrelation, right, or uh, uh, coefficient, right, this this p sort of thing that looks like a p there, okay. Um, and, and of course what that is, is an expression of the functional relationship between the current error term and the previous error term, right. Now you might say, well, you know, how do, how do we know that? Well, yeah, that's the thing, right, that's the thing with, with doing this work is that if you know if you know what p is, if you know the autocorrelation coefficient, then the correction is very easy for serial correlation problems. Um, but if you don't know it, uh, then you have to estimate it, which we'll we'll talk about a little later. Um, and finally, uh, if you attempt to estimate that autocorrelation coefficient and you get it wrong, uh, it's worth noting that you will have made your problem worse. <laughs> right? So uh, one has to be uh, cautious. Right. 
the Durbin Watson statistic can be given by this expression over here on the top, and that will vary between zero and four. To, to understand what our Durbin Watson statistic is telling us, right? So in our regression output, we're going to have a Durbin Watson statistic. As I say, it's going to vary between zero and four, and that value is going to tell you something about uh, the nature or the possibility and nature of your serial correlation. Now, uh, the number alone isn't enough to tell you sort of where you stand on things. To, to figure out your, the extent of your serial correlation, what we do is we take that statistic from, that we calculated above, uh, the durbin Watt statistic, or it's simply the value that's given on your regression output. Uh, we then use the sample size, right? So you know whatever our n is, as well as the number of explanatory variables, okay, which both of which uh, uh, impact our degrees of freedom associated with our estimated equation. Uh, and using also the Durbin-Watson table, right? So you get yourself a Durbin-Watson table. Uh, any good statistics books are certainly available, or certainly available online with a quick search. You're going to find a Durbin-Watson table, and from that table you can determine the upper and lower critical limits uh, associated with your test statistic. Okay. Okay, the second of the tests and the final test that we'll be discussing today about uh, detecting uh, serial correlation will be the Lagrange multiplier test. And uh, this considers how well time lag residuals explain the residual in the original estimated equation. So if you've been following this series so far, you know that uh, we've explained uh, multicollinearity, uh, or was it, excuse me, we've detected multicollinearity in a similar way, right? So where we're going to, in that case, we were trying to see whether our specific, a given specific independent variable could be explained by the other independent variables in our estimated equation. Uh, in this case, we're essentially doing the same same type of thing. All right, now from the result of that uh, that estimated regression, right, we're going to test to see whether alpha n plus one. Let's just go back quickly. Okay, so alpha n plus one, boom, right here. Okay, so that's our estimated coefficient on what our lagged error term. Okay. We're going to see test to see whether that is zero, which would imply what. If running this whole regression, that this excuse me, this whole regression, right, this turns out to be zero, then we can see that the historic error term here, et minus one, is not correlated in a meaningful way with the current error term. That we use this here, so this is our Lagrangian multiplier, so our result associated with that, equal to n r squared. Okay, so where n is our number of observations and r squared is our standard r squared from before, so observations times r squared. Okay. If we find that the Lagrangian multiplier, uh, the result of that process is greater than the critical value, then, then serial correlation is present. Right. Okay, then let's say we've run you know, one or more of these tests, Durbin-Watson, Lagrangian multiplier tests, and it turns out we have uh, serial correlation. How do we correct for it? Well, again, there are a number of methods for correcting for it. We are going to go through the sort of most bread and butter one, and that is this idea over here of generalized least squares. Okay. Now, as we said before, you know the, the problem with a serial correlation is that when we are using OLS or ordinary least squares, uh, it's no longer a minimum minimum variance minimum variance process. Excuse me. In other words, although our estimated coefficients remain unbiased, uh, the entire estimated equation no longer is minimizing uh, the squared value of the residuals. What GLS does is attempts to restore this, right? Attempts to restore the, the um, effectiveness of, of OLS as an estimation process. So to understand what GLS is doing uh, to do this, to make this correction, uh, let's just say here, <laughs> let's let's assume that we know this, the value of this parameter p, right? So let's assume that we know uh, the the functional relationship between the previous error term and the current error term, uh, sort of the first order order cor correlation condition. Okay. Um, now I know some of you are saying like, whoa, 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 I'm nervous now. Like I don't like those. Okay, yeah, I'll, we'll, we'll talk about, before this is over, right, we'll talk about how we might estimate that value too. Okay, so, you know, consider the uh, hypothesized relationship uh, over there, right? So we've got 
Y star, uh, beta, beta zero, it's a simple thing, right? So like Y in a given, the dependent variable in a given time period is a function of just this one variable X in the, that time period, okay? Um, but that the values of these, so the value of Y are, with value of everything here, right, is somehow a function of um, past observances, right? So that we, so, so say for example, we can express uh, current GDP as a function of historic GDP, okay? Uh, so we simply can't guess uh, at the impact of history. We have to figure out some way to estimate it, or if somehow by some miracle we know it, then then it's easy to, it's easy going. Okay, so why is this? Well, you know, as I said a couple times now, with serial correlation, the betas are not biased, right? But if we incorrectly estimate that value p, right, then we're going to introduce bias uh, across our equation. In other words, uh, you can think of this like this, right? If, if we're sort of, if we think we know the impact of history, but we get it wrong, right? Okay, well, like let's say we overestimate, this is unlikely, right? But we overestimate the, the sort of importance of history and understanding the current value of our variables. Well, uh, you know, then then we're essentially going to push all of, of all of our explanations off onto history more than we should, right? More than we should, uh, and so we're we're introducing bias into all of our estimated relationships by over attributing uh, to history. Uh, of course, we can we can go in the opposite direction too. Um, so you can see why it creates uh, potentially more problems than we even started with, right? Uh, you know, if we attribute everything to history, right, then 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 we're sort of path totally path determined, and there's nothing any anybody can do about anything. Uh, and if we completely ignore uh, history, then um, it's likely that we're not understanding some things. Okay. So, uh, however, if we can get that value right, right, then we can uh, adjust our estimated relationship in such a way that we can sort of recapture all the benefits of, of OLS estimation processes. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, there are multiple ways of doing this, right? Uh, I'm going to go through a, one of the, again, sort of bread and butter way of doing it. And so we would start by running the following regression that we see there on the top, right? Uh, but we're going to substitute the estimate estimated value for p, right? So we're gonna we're gonna regress the historic error term against the current error term to come up with this parameter. So we're going to, we're, you know, the same way we're always doing it, right? How we're gonna estimate the relationship between these two variables. We're gonna estimate the estimate, excuse me, we're gonna estimate the relationship between the error terms, right? And then we're gonna substitute that estimated relationship back into uh, the components of our original uh, hypothesized and eventually estimated relationship. And so what we're doing there, you can see in that lower equation, is we're removing off, uh, we're pulling off, or we're, if you allow a mixed metaphor here for a second, we're, we're deflating, um, <laughs> we're deflating for history, uh, uh, current observations from the impact of their historic observations, uh, in each case across the board, right, in terms of the dependent variable, the intercept term, as well as the independent or explanatory variable in this case. Okay. Okay, and that's it for this time, right? So that's serial correlation, a quick introduction, uh, as well as some of the procedures associated with identifying uh, serial correlation, uh, and then uh, discussing a little bit about the remedies associated with, with, with uh, that particular problem. Uh, that's it for this time. Uh, we'll see you again next time when we'll be introducing the topic of heteroscedasticity. See you then. Take care, everybody. Bye.